their live stream is up. Sergeant Belando, will you start your PC recording, please? Recording to the PC has begun. Okay. Recording to the cloud is up. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Sergeant Belando, you may begin with the opening. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Environmental Protection. At this time, would council staff please turn on their video? Please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. That is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you. Chair, we are ready to begin. All right. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Costa Constantinidis, Chair of the Committee on Environmental Protection. Today, this committee will address the mayor's fiscal 2022 uh, preliminary budget for the Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, the department's proposed fiscal 2022 expense budget totals $1.38 billion, and proposed capital commitment plan totals $12.7 billion over five years. The committee looks forward to hearing more about uh, the agency's capital investment strategy citywide, uh, the savings and other adjustments proposed in the preliminary plan, uh, the agency performance metrics. Uh, Commissioner Vincent Sapienza of the Department of Environmental Protection will be providing testimony today. I look forward to hearing from you, Commissioner, and everyone else who is testifying as far as public testimony. Uh, before I turn it over to the committee council, I just want to thank uh, every, everyone who was involved in getting this hearing started, our committee council, Samara Swanston, uh, Nadia Johnston and Ricky Chawla, our policy analysts, uh, Jonathan Seltzer, a financial analyst, my counsel, Nicholas Wazowski. I want to thank my, uh, also my committee members for being here, and I'll recognize them as they come. Uh, and lastly, I will put this on the record once again. Uh, I firmly believe we need a Department of Sustainability in the city of New York. To have this committee hearing and not have the Mayor's Office of Sustainability and not have the Mayor's Office of Resiliency and Recovery come before my committee or the Resiliency Committee and open their books and talk about the fact that we need to implement Renewable Rikers Island, need to implement Local 197, need to implement uh, you know, fiber resiliency plans, and not have a budget hearing because they were mayoralty are, are, are just part of the problem in the city of New York. We need to create a department of sustainability to be more transparent, at least right. more importantly, work on these issues. So with that, uh, this is not the, the commissioner's fault. He's not, <laughs> but I look forward to hearing from the commissioner and having our committee council uh, uh, go over some procedural items and swear into witnesses. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Samara Swanston, Counsel to the Environmental Protection Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you, when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please be aware that there could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelists will be. We will begin with the testimony from the administration, which will be followed by the testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including responses. I will call on you when it's your turn to speak. Thank you, and I would now like to hand it off to Council, uh, to Chair Constantinidis. Great, thank you, Samara. Uh, I am looking to see if any of my colleagues, I see that Councilmember Rosenthal is here, though she's not a member of the committee. It's always great to have Councilmember Rosenthal here with us. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal, for being here. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to, um, uh, Commissioner Sapienza and, and Samara, if you can issue the, uh, the swearing in of the witnesses. Thank you. Thank you, Costa. I will now deliver the oath to the administration, and I will call on you each individually to record your answers to be followed by your testimony. 
Please raise your right hands. <clears throat> Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Chair uh, Sapienza? I do. And um, Michael, uh, Chair, uh, Chair Mike, Michael De La Roche? I do, Samara. <laughs> Thank you. I'll now turn it over to, <clears throat> and you may begin when ready. Thank you. Yours. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Chair Constantinidis, members of the Committee on Environmental Protection. I am mm -hmm. Vincent Sapienza, the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, or DEP. I'm here today to speak about the FY22 preliminary budget and the FY21 preliminary mayor's management report. Uh, I'd like to just briefly highlight some pandemic related issues that DEP continues to manage. Just first on our operational challenges. DEP has felt the impact of the pandemic and we've made significant operational adjustments over the last 12 months. Our focus has been to ensure that all critical services are uninterrupted. Our dedicated staff, the majority of whom work outdoors in all weather, continue to provide 1 billion gallons per day of high quality drinking water, to manage wastewater and stormwater, and to reduce air, noise, and hazardous materials pollution. They deserve our gratitude for their perseverance and for the frequent double shifts, nights, weekends uh, that they work to cover for their ill and quarantining colleagues. Uh, I'd like to note that some of the operational challenges spurred opportunities for improvement, uh, and I'll speak about that shortly. Uh, regarding COVID-19 related fiscal challenges, uh, water revenues for FY21 to date have decreased by about 7% uh, compared to FY20. One reason is that the commercial water consumption has declined, uh, which reduces the amount billed. Another reason is delinquent accounts or accounts that have been uh, unpaid for more than 30 days. On December 31st, 2020, there were 16,000 more delinquent accounts than there were on December 31st, 2019. Much of the increase in delinquencies is from class, tax class two and four multifamily properties, uh, which is probably indicative of rent collection challenges. I wanna be clear that DEP continues to offer payment assistance programs to all rate payers who qualify. And we offer payment plans to anyone in need. I encourage any account holder who is struggling to contact our Bureau of Customer Service, who can work with you to develop manageable payment plans uh, to minimize interest and penalties. So DEP is not currently at risk of running an FY21 deficit due to prudent planning last April. The continuing revenue shortfall has real impacts. Most of our operating costs are fixed, such as for chemicals, residual disposal, and labor, and expenses related to property taxes that we pay to upstate municipalities for city-owned reservoirs and surrounding lands continues to grow, now at $167 million. So FY21 budget modifications primarily had to come from our capital program. We deferred about $1.2 billion in FY20 capital work, and we have since resequenced other projects in our 10-year plan. I want to highlight DEP's significant capital obligations for unfunded federal and state environmental mandates, including the Gowanus Canal Superfund, the Filtration Avoidance Program, Hilvey Reservoir Upgrade, nitrogen removal, and citywide combined sewer overflow or CSO reductions. We've reached out to both EPA and New York State DEC to ask for temporary relief on certain regulatory milestones for these massive overlapping projects. Those conversations are ongoing. Without relief though, some planned capital work for maintaining a state of good repair at our drinking water reservoirs, wastewater treatment plants, and for new water mains and storm sewers may be delayed. I want to also mention that other municipalities face these same pressures and Boston, Philadelphia, Washington DC and Baltimore all recently raised their annual water billing rates between 6.7% and 9% to meet these obligations. Portland, Oregon is doing five consecutive 7.4% rate increases to meet EPA mandates. Uh, now just a bit on COVID-19 related achievements. Some of the challenges created by the pandemic hastened improvements to our public services, 
and we began to do many interactions virtually. I was superb staff in the Bureau of Information Technology, worked nonstop to develop online tools to support many functions while our borough offices were closed to the public. Our IT Bureau also configured laptops so that some of our support staff could perform functions like procurement and vendor payments via teleworking. As the City Council is aware, DEP worked with DOHMH and several experts to establish a coronavirus wastewater testing program last spring. Since last summer, we've been testing wastewater from each of our 14 plants every week to quantify viral fragments. The testing program gives DOHMH an additional piece of information for identifying potential outbreaks around the city. DEP also aided other city agencies during the peak of the pandemic when disinfectant was hard to find. Our lab staff produced more than 17,000 gallons of hand sanitizer, which was distributed to other agencies, to the visiting nurse service, and to the public in city parks last spring. Other DEP employees volunteered at command centers and to make calls to identify critical PPE needs around the city. I'd like to highlight just a few non-COVID related achievements. There were fewer water main breaks in FY20 than on any year on record. We have long had one of the most reliable water main systems in the country, and we now average just five breaks for every 100 miles of water main, while the national average for large cities is 25 breaks per 100 miles. We built 3,000 rain gardens in calendar year 2020, which is a record number of installations. And we addressed air quality and noise complaints faster than in the past, in part because we now have staff scheduled on evening and night shifts to respond to these complaints. So looking forward, despite the challenges from COVID-19, our commitment to our mission has not wavered. We continue to provide critical services to protect public environmental health in the city. I am proud of the work that all of our staff have done to continue to serve New Yorkers throughout the pandemic. We look forward to our future endeavors, including assessing Rikers Island as a potential site for future centralized wastewater resource recovery facilities. I congratulate the council and Chair Constantinidis in particular for re-envisioning the vast potential of Rikers for all New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Commissioner, it's always great to see you uh, and I'm glad that you're staying safe first and foremost. Um, I, I want to recognize at least Council Member Dharma Diaz is here from Brooklyn. Council Member Carlos Menchaca is here from Brooklyn as well. I recognize Council Member Rosenthal, and I think those are all the one that's here so far. Uh, so I'll begin with uh, sort of picking up something on your testimony. Uh, you talked a little bit about potential shortfalls. Have we evaluated the stimulus package that? looks like it's going to pass, hopefully. Uh, will it benefit the EP? You know, I know it's gonna benefit the city of New York. I've heard lots of things, but are there things in that stimulus package that'll help meet those shortfalls or we're still gonna be left uh, with, a, with a gap? Mr. Chair, we haven't yet evaluated uh, what, what's in the, uh, the package. Um, we, we've heard some good things about infrastructure, money, but don't know if there's anything specific uh, for, for water and sewer needs in the city. Uh, so we just don't know yet whether that those dollars and you talk the state um, i know the state is proposing to continue uh, epf funding at 300 million uh i know funding's marked for solid waste programs and and rec and rec uh, parks and recreation climate mitigation uh has dep gotten any of that money in the past we haven't, although uh, some of it may be available. We, we have looked at it in the past, and um, it just it didn't make sense for us at the time. But you know, we'll reconsider that as well as other state money that that's that's available. Okay, great. I mean, look, if, if we're eligible and we can, and you know, we send more money to Albany than Albany sends back to us. So, frankly, there, there's no. Uh, we should be looking for ways to get funding from the state because the state too often is. Uh, more than eager to take money out of New York City and leave us with shortfalls. Um, so I hope that we will evaluate these dollars. Uh, looking at uh, the Hillsview Re Reservoir cover, uh, I know the preliminary capital commitment plan includes 50 million to cover the east and west basins of a 90 acre Hill uh, Hillview Reservoir pursuant to a consent decree with the federal government in New York City. Uh, since the reservoir is downstream from where it receives treatment as an open storage facility, the finished water in the reservoir is subject to recontamination. The cover is there to keep that from happening. 
what's the timeline to build out uh, through this consent, uh, consent decree? Uh, does $50 million cover the entire project, only part of it? Uh, and until this is in operation, are we taking active measures to control wildlife in and around the reservoir uh, to make sure that it's still not being recontaminated? Mr. Chair, all, all great questions. Uh, just as a little bit of background, several years ago, EPA required all municipalities in the nation to cover what they call finished water reservoirs. And the Hillview Reservoir, which has been in service in the city for almost a century, um, is, is our finished water reservoir. Uh, it's a large facility and covering it is gonna take a lot of time and a lot of money. That $50 million is uh, just really for a preliminary uh, design and, and looking at some of the uh, ways to do it, but it's, it's gonna be a multi-billion dollar project and it's gonna take time to do. In the meantime, to, to protect the reservoir, we've done a bunch of things uh, for, for many years now. We've had what we call bird wire uh, strung across the 90 acres of reservoir to ensure that birds can't land in it. Uh, it's a well-protected facility, uh, but, but moving forward, we have to comply with the EPA requirement and we're actively doing so. So this 50 million is just for design and, and for sort of getting things started. It's, we're gonna need several billion dollars to get this done. That's right. Do we know how many years that will take and, and sort of how, you know, how that's going to work? Yeah, we, we've worked with EPA. There are a number of things beside a cover at Hillview that we need to do, um, including some work on, on the mechanical facilities, the chemical facilities. We're doing that uh, during this decade. Um, and then we have milestones um, thereafter uh, that we've agreed to with EPA to build the cover, but it's, it's a long-term project. So let me go into some, a subject that's always, uh, we talk about every year, uh, the water rate, right? Do we, uh, I know for fiscal 2020, uh, there were many projects you talked about that were uh, displaced because of COVID-19 restrictions and, and just the realities of the COVID-19 world. And now they're sort of being pushed into this, this sort of this coming fiscal year and beyond this five-year capital plan. Uh, do we see, uh, how is that going to affect our capital needs, the dollars that we have to lay out uh, do, do, do is the mayor requesting a rental payment this year? We know that for the previous years, if not asked for a rental payment, we'd end the practices of rental payments. I went out to Brooklyn and stood with everyone to make that announcement. But I know last year during the pandemic, there was a request for a rental payment. Um, do we foresee the mayor asking for rental payment this year as well? So I'll just I'll, I'll start with uh, capital projects. So, so you're, you're you're right, Mr. Chair. In FY20. Um, we, we committed less than half of the projects uh, that we were going to register and it was done intentionally to, to preserve cash, uh, but those projects are, are, are now getting um, registered this year, including uh, city water till number three, the last two shafts. So we're happy to get a shovel in the ground there. Um, on the water rate, typically in April or May, the New York City Water Board meets to go through the financials, the, the needs to um, ad address issues for, for both DEP's funding for operations and maintenance and the, the water finance authorities needs uh, for, for bonding. Uh, we don't know what the rate is yet, uh, but, but there likely will be a rate increase to meet uh, the obligations that are there. Um, regarding the uh, rental payment, the, the, under the lease agreement uh, between the, the water board and the city, and this goes back to state law in the 1980s, the city is allowed to request a rental payment um, from the board. Uh, the mayor for for got for go that ent rental payment in fiscal 17 18 and 19 uh, the city did take a partial rental payment in fiscal 20 um, late in the fiscal year uh, due to due to the pandemic and took another partial payment this year in fiscal 21 the the city's preliminary budget for fiscal 22 does not call for a rental payment um, so uh, we're, we're not looking at that at this point um, but but again the, the city has the right under the lease agreement to take one well, you know, just because you can do a thing doesn't mean you should do a thing. Um, so I hope that we're not going to get back into that practice of uh, taking money out of our water, from our water and sewer ratepayers out of DEP and then having to give that to the general fund. It's, that's not what the money's there for. Um, you know, we, we definitely have a really sort of challenging budget time. I will not diminish that in any way, shape or form, but I hope that we're not going to, you know, balance the books uh, based on water rates again, because DEP needs every dollar it can get frankly. Uh, and I know you can't comment. <laughs> uh, so let's, let's next go on capital commitments. 
Um, looking at Flushing Bay and, and Flushing Creek long-term control plans that were approved by DEP uh, in March of 2017, currently uh, what appropriated uh, preliminary capital commitments, the 10-year capital plan for that project? Yeah, so part of uh, all of our, what we call uh, combined sewer overflow long-term control plans, um, one of them for Flushing Bay is to build a, a massive underground storage tunnel that would store the, the stormwater runoff from the street that otherwise would have gone uh, untreated into Flushing Bay and Creek, S store that in the tunnel until the rain is over, and then that wastewater would be pumped to a wastewater treatment plant for treatment. Um, we've been working with DEC on a number of plans, not just for Flushing Bay, but other water bodies uh, and trying to sequence when the work will be done. Obviously it's, it's many billions of dollars to have this work um, initiated and, and, and completed. Uh, and Flushing Bay, the tunnel there happens to be particularly complex. There's a lot of engineering challenges and siting challenges, uh, but that we're, we're you know, beginning the, the design on that and that work is gonna move forward, but it, but it is a long, what we call a long-term project. And how does the potential for renewable Rikers fit into that? I um, know that we're about to begin the feasibility studies for the wastewater treatment capture amongst other things on the, on the island. Uh, how do you sort of envision, uh, number one, what is the cost estimate for this study? Uh, you know, how did we arrive at that number? And sort of what do you see as a potential, uh, what current wastewater treatment facilities could potentially move or you know, monies we would not have to spend otherwise by moving uh, a wastewater treatment plant onto the island? Yeah, so, so just um, you know, a little bit of an overview. There are four wastewater treatment plants that the city operates uh, that are right along the East River, um, two in Queens, one in the Bronx, and I guess one technically in Manhattan, it's the Wards Island plant, but um, three of those plants were built in the 1930s, one around 1950, um, so you know, they're getting up there in age, and Rikers pr potentially presents a great opportunity to um, consolidate those, those four aging plants in, into one new location, and uh, so we currently have a study, uh, it should be underway shortly. It's about a $3 million study to determine whether, um, you know, it's feasible to locate uh, wastewater facilities on Rikers Island um, and have the water from the mainland essentially pumped there and treated there. Uh, and, and that would potentially open up uh, the, the sites, a couple of hundred acres of land where the four current plants are located for, for another public benefit or a better public benefit um, than, than wastewater treatment. Um, so, you know, we certainly want to look at that as, as an opportunity, but it does tie into some of the combined sewer overflow long-term control plans and where we site things and, and, and how uh, wastewater, stormwater is handled. So just to, again, it would be Bowery Bay, College Point, Wards Island, and Hunts Point as well, right? That's right. Our College Point plan at Tolman Island uh, is potentially a, a move as well. Yeah. And Hunts Point, even though we're making the current investments, still it's 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 there's potential to close Hunts Point as well, right? Or at least right. some of that. That's right. I mean, a, a, any potential plant at Rikers Island would would take more than a decade. So there are investments that currently still need to be made at those facilities. I know my count, my my colleague Councilmember Salmon will be very excited to hear about that. So I'm going to make sure I flag that for him. Um, and then lastly, before I turn this over to any questions from my colleagues, catch basins. Uh, I know we have the law that, um, you know, to clean every year. I think now it's, you know, if, since it's sunset, it'll be two years. Uh, last year, uh, in, in the first four months of fiscal 21, we cleaned about 10,000, which was about 5,000 less. Uh, talk to me a little bit about how we're doing on the cleaning of catch basins and, and maintenance of catch basins during COVID. And, and how, what do we think? in this fiscal year, we'll be able to meet the mandate of getting uh, catch basins cleaner because without the additional street sweeping, I know, we, we're, you know they're, they're talking about only having the street sweeping once a week. Uh, there are even more, the streets are even dirtier. And I've seen, I've seen catch basins that are really, and streets that are really quite dirty. Um, and I just don't want all, those, all that stuff becoming floatables in our water bodies. So how are we doing on, on cleaning of our catch basins and our streets? You know, we agree. Catch basin cleaning is one of the most important things that DEP does, again, to keep floatables out of our waterways, to, um, you know, keep streets from, from flooding during rain. So um, we've put a lot of effort into it. As you, as you mentioned, that during the past few years on the local law, we, we were doing annual inspections of 
all 148,000 catch basins in the city and cleaning as necessary. Um, going forward, we've identified, I guess, areas where more frequent attention is required, and those are mostly on commercial avenues and boulevards. Uh, some of the residential blocks we've, we've looked at and you know, over a three year period didn't require any cleaning. They're just you know, on, on low traffic streets. Um, th this past year, we've seen, I guess, just because of, of COVID, less foot traffic on, on many streets, and there's been a little bit less debris. Uh, but, but moving forward, again, we're going to continue doing those inspections uh, where they're required and, and cleaning is necessary. Yeah, but I mean, I, I've seen streets just not in good repair and catch basins that sort of like bore the brunt of that. So I hope that we're, we're even though we're seeing less foot traffic, we're seeing more litter. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that we will sort of revisit some of these corridors. Uh, I'll give it, I saw that Councilmember Levin from Brooklyn, another member of our committee is here today. Thank you, Councilmember Levin for being here. Do any of my colleagues have any questions at this time? I don't, I don't want to hog all of the question time. Tamara, do we have, does anyone have their hand up or anybody interested in having questions before I go on? Uh, I don't see any raised hands. Okay, all right. All right, so I'm going to ask, uh, Commissioner, I'm going to ask two more questions and then I'm going to let you go if, if my colleagues have no other questions. Uh, I know you touched on city water tunnel number three. Um, so you talked about we're getting shovel into the ground into the last two shafts. Uh, can you give me an update on sort of operationally what our, our capital commitment is there? What's our plan for, what's our new timeline for, for getting those things done? Uh, you know, what, what are we looking at with the water tunnel long term? Yeah, so uh, the third city water tunnel, uh, which the, the tunnel itself uh, ha, ha, has been completed and, and we have two more shafts to bring water from that 700 foot deep tunnel to the surface. Um, we, we, and this is really the last piece before the, the tunnel is fully uh, online, which is great because it helps us then um, do maintenance work on, on city water tunnel number one, which has been in service continually now for 100 years. Uh, so we really want to get this work done. But um, the last two shifts, we intended to register the contract uh, towards the end of fiscal 20, but because of uh, COVID, we want to preserve that cash. And we just registered it. It's in November of 2020, so in fiscal 21, um, and, and work is starting there. So the, the, the work under this, I guess it's about $330 million contract is to dig these two deep shafts, 700 feet deep. Um, in 2024, then we'll then fit out uh, the mechanical piping to, to have the water distributed, but um, we're, we're looking for mid 2020s to have uh, the, the tunnel fully completed. Okay. Um, and then lastly, on COVID-19 impacts and operations. First, I want to I want to reiterate uh, from your statement. I want to thank every worker from DEP um, for all of their great work during the pandemic. Uh, I know how difficult uh, this has been for the city as a whole. Uh, but I know that the men and women at DEP have showed up for work every day and, and done a great job. So I really want to commend them and commend you for all of the great work that your department's done during this really challenging time. And I hope that uh, everyone in the DEP family is safe and healthy. Uh, so thank you for that. I appreciate uh, it. Uh, uh, just one on. Council member Levin has his hand up. All right, great. I'm gonna ask this question on, on COVID operations and, I'll, and then I'll pass it over to council member Levin. Thank you, Samara. Uh, have we seen more fatbergs or, or, or sort of blockages? Basically, I know everyone is cooking at home. Um, are we seeing more blockages or sort of the same amount of fatbergs uh, since the, the pandemic has begun? Uh, I know that we passed uh, local law 19, uh, uh, well, I don't know the local law number, but intro 1966A around testing. Wanted to get an update on uh, you know, how the testing program is going. Uh, how do we see uh, any additional testing needed uh, and, and sort of how frequent is the testing occurring and at how many sites? Okay, just, just on Fatbergs, uh, I'm, I'm gonna say we haven't seen any increase. The last data I looked mm -hmm. at, Mr. Chair, which was about a month ago, it looked like we hadn't seen any increase. Now, mm -hmm. that's not to say that it, it's still not at a very high level. I mean, we, we've done a lot of public outreach uh, particularly about flushable wipes. Uh, we've had the Fatberg Free NYC program, um, but 
you know, we're, we're, we're still doing a lot of, a lot of cleaning of, of our, our sewers. We're getting a lot of material at our wastewater treatment plants that needs to be removed. So that's still uh, at quite a high level. And what was the second question about number of sites? Around the, around the testing, around the, uh, the testing for COVID in our water. Uh, how is it going? What, how much you know, additional, are we doing additional testing? Where the testing is all sites and so on. Yeah, so we're testing uh, all 14 plants uh, of our wastewater treatment plants. It's twice a week now. We've been doing that since the summer. We've been getting a lot of really good information. I mean, what we're, we're finding essentially matches up with what DOHMH is finding through uh, the traditional means that, that, that they test people who, who come in for tests. Uh, what we're really excited about and looking forward to is to continue the sewage testing uh, as the, the rate of infection comes down because um, we think as, as folks get the vaccine and we're seeing fewer people either coming in for testing or, or, or getting sick, um, that the sewage testing will really help us identify any hot spots that may pop up. Um, and I think that's when this information will be particularly valuable. Well, I look forward to seeing that data. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm gonna pass it over to Councilman Levin because I see he has his hand up. Thank you, Councilman Levin, for being here. It's all yours. Time starts now. <clears throat> Thanks, Chair. Um, uh, Commissioner, nice to see you. I, I, uh, I realized I didn't want to uh, pass up the opportunity of being, this is my last uh, preliminary budget hearing um, with DEP. I didn't want to pass up the opportunity to ask about um, Newtown Creek and the, um, the, uh, the nature walk and, um, uh, and the status of, of monitoring at the Newtown Creek Wastewater Treatment Facility, the status and also the the, the status of the um, uh, National Grid project as well. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so just I'll start with the nature walk. So uh, yeah, Newtown Creek went through a significant capital upgrade uh, just just in, in the past several years, um, and one of the things that the community said they wanted to see as part of the upgrade is waterfront access. So uh, we put. Uh, a first phase of the nature walk and server several years ago, but continue to build that out um, so that local residents or anyone can have access to the, the, the Newtown Creek water body um, behind the back of the plant. And I was there, uh, I'm gonna say probably in December, phase three, the last phase of the, the um, nature walk was underway. So I'm, I'm guessing, you know, sometimes later this year, um, it'll, it'll be open to the public. And uh, Mike, I have Michael Deloach on from our public affairs. Michael, do you have any additional information on the nature walk? Uh, yeah, they're just finishing the punch list now. So we're looking to, I think, open it in the coming weeks. And we wanted to do you know, something celebratory in the early summer, uh, you know, pandemic willing. And then um, just on, on monitoring uh, the Newtown Creek water body. So we continually take samples. Um, you know, we, we know that it's challenged from combined sewer overflows during wet weather. And we, we have long-term control plans to, to do upgrades there. So that, that work is, uh, is continuing. Um, and, and what was the other question, council member? There was a third. Just... The biogas. The biogas. Okay, so um, just on that, we, at, we as everything everybody uh, knows when they when they drive by the plant or on the Long Island Expressway, we have these uh, egg-shaped digesters that break down the organic material in sewage. They produce a lot of methane gas just as a byproduct, more gas than the, the treatment plant could use on its own for its own facility. So uh, we've been working with National Grid to take that excess gas and feed it into the local utility pipeline to. Um, provide gas to, to local residents and that work is underway and we think sometime uh, within the next few months we should have all of that work done and and again as Michael said we'll have a ribbon cutting for that one at some point as well. Councilman Levin do you have any more questions? He's on mute sir. Okay. I, I just wanted to add that that would be great to see a um, an opening of the national grid, the biogas project, because it's been delayed for for quite a while. And I think that um, um, you know members of the community are asking me about you know what the what the status is on it and 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 the latest. So um, I, I would uh, I appreciate any updates that you're able to give. Sure, and and we did have some delays. Uh, 
both related to, to DEP issues and national grid issues, but I think we've, we've resolved them over the winter. So we're, we're in better shape now. And, and okay. you and you and Councilman Reynoso had given us a letter outlining a bunch of questions about this. The response is coming to you this week. So we'll, we'll have everybody updated. Excellent. Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks guys. Thank you, Councilman Lemon. Appreciate it as always, my friend. Um, so commissioner, I don't, I don't see any other hands. So I'll begin by saying, um, you know, this is my last preliminary budget hearing with you. Uh, I want to thank you for all of your partnership over the years. So um, thank you for all the work that you've done for DEP and, and continue to do as now commissioner for, for quite some time. So I look forward to our continued partnership moving forward. Um, and I just want to remind the public that it looks like things are moving a little bit more quickly today. Um, so if you are a member of the public, if you're watching this hearing, if you're interested in testifying, uh, please sign up because it looks like the public portion of our testimony will be earlier today. Uh, so please, um, if you're interested in testifying, if you're a member of the public and you plan on testifying, uh, now is the time to register. Now is the time to get on the docket uh, because it looks like we're going to end a little bit earlier based on uh, the pace of the hearing right now. Uh, so with that, Commissioner and, and Michael as well, thank you both for your friendship and partnership. And I look forward to working with you guys uh, as we move forward with this budget and appreciate your answers today. And uh, right now, I'll, I'll, I'll end your testimony. Thanks. Same here, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. Thank you. So, Samara, I guess if we can uh, call the next witnesses. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, we'll now turn to the public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin setting the timer. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. I'd now like to welcome Bob Cooney, who is going to testify, uh, who will be followed by Karen Imus. Bob? Time starts now. You have to unmute yourself, Bob. Okay. Good day, Chairman Constantine and council members. My name is Robert Cooney. I'm testifying in support of backup power for the Croton water plant in the Bronx. Most of the plant's water needs to be pumped, but the plant has no backup power. The Croton plant was built underground in the Bronx Park in the face of strong community opposition. The plant replaced two old pumping stations that had backup power. Just before the DEP discovered the current site in mid-1998, a report shows that all seven sites under consideration had backup power. The selected site was the closest that the uh, DEP could get to the Jerome Park Reservoir where the underground plumbing comes together. The DEP left out backup power to reduce their footprint in the park and obtain site approval. So after spending $3.7 billion on the plant, the city's water supply is at risk in an emergency. Most of New York City's water comes from the Catskill and Delaware systems. However, the Catskill water system is vulnerable at several locations where the systems come together. The Croton system is entirely separate and most of the water needs to be pumped. It is the city's backup water supply. The Croton plan uses gravity to send some of its water to low-lying areas in Manhattan and the Bronx. Most of the water, however, needs to be pumped to reach Riverdale, Washington Heights, Morningside Heights, most of Midtown and Brooklyn, Queens and Staten Island. New York City is the only American city that has been attacked by foreign, foreign operators since Pearl Harbor. It happened twice. The next time could be a huge blast that will also knock out power. The lack of power, of backup power for this plant could destroy thousands of lives and considerable property. From 2010 to 2018, AECOM, the consulting engineer for the Municipal Water Finance Authority, stated in their yearly report 
New York City DEP is reviewing the energy demand for standby power for the Croton water plant to increase dependability in case of a major power outage. The administrative code should be changed to require backup power for this plant. Temporary power should be in place ASAP until it can be made permanent. It should be in place before the Delaware Aqueduct is taken out of service next year. This was detailed in a letter sent to this committee on January 21st, 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> I'll now call on Karen Imus of the Waterfront Alliance to testify, whose testimony will be followed by Sonel Gesso of WE Act. Karen? Time starts now. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, we do, Karen. Great. Um, so um, the, this is the public testimony portion, is that correct? Um, yes. yes. Okay, oh, sorry, apologies, I had a little tech glitch there. Um, so thank you for, thank you for um, inviting us mm -hmm. and thank you for holding this hearing. Um, I wanted to A, introduce Waterfront Alliance. As you know, we're a nonprofit advocacy organization focused on uh, resilient and revitalized waterfronts. Um, and we're here today to comment on a couple of issues related to the FY22 budget. Um, as you know, one of the, um, uh, we've seen a lot of successes with, um, I think, climate change legislation over the last several years in the council, um, much to the leadership of council member Constantinidis and other council members from, you know, renewable Rikers to green buildings legislation. Um, I think an important um, piece of our, our climate change successes also have to do with environmental education uh, initiatives. And I wanted to speak for a moment to a Greener NYC, uh, which is an initiative that funds um, advocacy and environmental education organizations that are working to really bring um, uh, green jobs trainings, conservation knowledge, STEM uh, awareness, um, and really understanding some of the uh, both really science-based issues, but also future climate issues that are going to affect our communities and bring this to uh, public school students um, and other uh, young people across the city. Um, we uh, recently led a coalition of uh, 20 plus organizations who have uh, benefited from a Greener NYC, who've engaged with tens of thousands of students across the city to really advocate for the continued funding uh, of this initiative and, and to reinstate it to pre-pandemic funding levels. This is an incredibly important um, funding source for organizations um, uh, and, and really to think about um, how we prepare the city for a future of, of climate change. It's not only about um, the, the great policy victories that we've seen, but it's preparing a future workforce. It is about climate activism, about climate engagement, and about encouraging our youth to think about, um, think about issues and career pathways related to ecology and conservation, planting trees, uh, marine biology, things of that nature that um, sometimes in our, our, our concrete jungle we don't think about but are so incredibly important. So um, uh, I think the Greener NYC initiative is such an important thing that this council has been doing and we, we encourage its continued, um, uh, continued success. The other thing I wanted to mention is um, uh, the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. Um, as you know, the Mayor's Office of Resiliency has really been very central to a lot of the important resiliency initiatives the city has undertaken post Sandy, including developing climate resilient design guidelines. The funding of this office is attached to uh, federal funding yeah. for um, uh, post Sandy and that federal funding um, uh, is exhausted in FY 2022. And so the continued um, uh, success of this office, the continued, um, uh, the continuing its work, the institutional knowledge of its staff is, is essential. And um, we, are, we are advocating for the city budget to look at how to allow MOR to continue doing its work post 2022, which is going to be essential um, for, for continuing to prepare the city uh, for, for really planning for 520 miles of coastal resilience. So, uh, definitely advocating for keeping MOR an important piece of our city budget moving forward. Um, thank you so much for your time today and, and for all the council members work 
uh, to continue to put um, environmental issues front and center in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And I agree with you. And I, I'm, you know, I was frustrated to find out how we found out relating to this funding that it was running out. Um, I absolutely agree with you that we need to prioritize this in our budget. And if the federal government is not to provide additional funds, we have to, to sort of make this part of our budget. Uh, and frankly, we need a Department of Sustainability and Resiliency that can implement all of these great initiatives that is more transparent than a current mayoralty. Um, um, so I agree with you across the board. And as far as protecting Green or NYC, and, and uh, it's an amazing initiative. I, you know, last year was a very tough budget year. I know this is something we're going to be fighting for in this year's budget. So thank you for testifying today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. Uh, and now I'd like to welcome Sunel Jesso of WEAC to testify. Sunel? Time starts now. Thank you, uh, Samara. Hi, uh, Chair Consanginides. Nice to see you. And um, thanks, everyone else, for, for giving me the time to testify. So uh, my name is Sunel Jesso. I'm the Director of Policy at WEAC for Environmental Justice. Over the past 32 years, WEAC has been combating environmental racism in northern Manhattan. I myself have a master in public health from Columbia University. Um, I'm here concerned about the communities we serve in Northern Manhattan, which is heavily black, African-American, Latino, low income, hard hit by the COVID pandemic. I'm testifying today mostly as a member of the Climate Works for All Coalition outlining the budget items we believe are vital for a just transition to the city. Um, so Climate Works for All Coalition has developed an equitable recovery. Uh, to move forward with this crisis, creating 100,000 jobs for Black and Brown communities and moving us towards climate solutions. Um, however, we know the solutions outlined in the report are geared towards the long-term recovery of the city, and we're still in the middle of a crisis. So we're advocating for the following 2021 budget items. The, the first couple are, pri are particularly a priority for this committee, but I'm going to outline all of them for your um, information and knowledge. So we are asking for $80 million in retrofitting public schools to meet local on 97 standards. The funding would go towards schools that are currently emitting above the 2030, 2034 standards. An annual investment of 80 million would bring a large portion of high emitting schools to compliance by 2035. So that would be um, a big impact. We're also in asking for an investment of 100 million in solar on schools. Funding would go towards solar installations on public schools an annual investment of 50 million would also would allow us to meet our goals, our solar goals by 2025. The other things we're asking for as well throughout many committees here uh, this year is investing 17 million in public waste management. Um, 4 million of that would go to DSNY to hire staff for the commercial waste zone program. Uh, 13 million would go towards doubling the impact of current community composting, food scrap drop off programs. Um, and adding more local scale processing sites and com compensating staff, ongoing support for social co school composting, beginning government building composting, piloting and studying organics collection, collection and recycling in multifamily buildings. Um, so that would, that would go pretty far. We're also asking for 3 million for clean transportation expansions. This includes funding towards electric school buses through the city's new school buses at the school bus company that they now have, um, NYCS bus. Um, and so the total investment we're asking for is 200 million towards these existing programs to move us towards the climate goals. I'll also add like we act specifically, one thing that we're really interested in seeing is the Get Cool NYC program happen again. I know that's really up in the air at this point, but um, if it is something that we can be doing again this year to continue to get people, our, our older adults ACs, that would be great. If not at least money for repairing ACs for people that have them. We're hearing a lot of reports about broken ACs, malfunctioning ones. So even just money for making sure that folks ACs that already exist are working um, would be really great. We're also interested in money for cooling center programs specifically. Uh, we also know the mayor set aside 284 million for East Harlem waterfront, which we're really excited about. So however we can you know, get these all going and, and, and get these in the budget would be, would be great. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sunil. <clears throat> And finally, we'd like to get welcome testimony from Noah Chesnin, who is with the Wildlife Conservation Society. Noah, would you please? 
Oh. Time oh, starts a... now. Okay. Time starts now. Thank you. Noah? Thank you. Thank you, Chair Constantinides and members of the Environmental Protection Committee. My name is Noah Chesnan, and I'm the Associate Director for the Wildlife Conservation Society's New York Seascape Program, which is based at the New York Aquarium. The Wildlife Conservation Society, WCS, includes the Bronx Zoo, New York Aquarium, Central Park Zoo, Prospect Park Zoo, and the Queens Zoo. And we work to save wildlife and wild places worldwide through science, conservation action, education, and inspiring people to value nature. WCS is a member of the Cultural Institutions Group, and like many cultural organizations, despite temporary closures of the parks to the public due to the pandemic, um, we've still uh, continued to uh, work through our advance our mission and serve the public and harnessing the power of WCS's global conservation program in nearly 60 countries um, and throughout our five parks we've been working to deliver quality virtual programming to New Yorkers um, throughout the pandemic. I'm here today to to ask that as the council determines its budget priorities for FY 2022 we ask that the cultural budget be held harmless and maintained at FY21 levels as we wait further information on COVID federal relief that may be, may be made available uh, to the city and state. And with regard to the city's environmental funding, we are also very strongly supportive. And in particular, we wanna highlight the, in, the greener, a greener NYC funding. Um, this initiative is critical to support community-led conservation efforts across the city. Uh, WCS's New York Aquarium's conservation work aligns with the city's environmental funding priorities. You know, New York City is a city of islands at the edge of the Atlantic Ocean, and we're, we're, we're fortunate to have an ecological treasure trove of sea turtles, whales, sharks, and a diverse array of other species. And the New York Aquarium works to connect New Yorkers with our ocean backyard and work collaboratively to advance marine conservation solutions that protect marine wildlife support and empower local communities. And just wanted to highlight a couple examples that align with the city's funding and especially the Greener NYC funding. So we do field research and citizen science uh, monitoring, uh, whether it's on whales or fishes, sharks, uh, and we design these opportunities to build in student and community member participation to build STEM skills and, and create pathways for jobs. We work actively in Coney Island Creek which is an important community and ecological asset. And with community partners, we're working to weave together marine conservation, environmental justice, and social equity to advance ecological restoration of the creek and community resilience to climate change. With regard to offshore wind and climate change, um, we, we offer praise for the ambitious and necessary city climate goals. Time expired. Um, and we, we think that there's an important opportunity here to think about STEM ecological monitoring jobs uh, as ways for pathways for hiring people across the city. So with that, I just wanna say thank you. We appreciate the work that the city and the council is doing to advance the environmental budget. We ask that you hold harmless the FY21 uh, funding for, or FY22 funding for the city's cultural budget as well as the environmental funding, and in particular, a greener NYC. Thank you very much. Costa. Chair, you are muted. Councilmember Ulrich, do you have a question for, for this witness? See that I want to recognize that you're here as well. Councilmember Ulrich from Queens. Oh, thank, thank you, Chair. No, no questions at this time, but uh, thank you and uh, keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Ulrich. Thank you, sir. Uh, Samara, are there any other witnesses wishing to be heard at this time? Uh, at, the, at the present time, uh, I don't see any other witnesses who have registered to testify. <clears throat> I'd like to ask, is there anyone who's registered to testify, but whose name I have not called? Uh, seeing none, I will turn it over now to Chair Constantinides for any closing remarks. Uh, again, uh, I want to thank uh, DEP, uh, Commissioner Sapienza, uh, Michael Deloche, 
uh, and the great DEP staff for all their great work and, and for testifying here today. I wanna to thank all of the witnesses that took time out of their schedule to be heard. Uh, I wanna thank uh, Samara Swanston, our legislative council, uh, our uh, policy analyst, Ricky Chala and uh, Nadia Johnson, our financial analyst, Jonathan Seltzer, uh, my legislative council and legislative director, Nicholas Wazowski. Uh, I wanna thank all the members of the committee uh, who were here today. And uh, you know, this is our last, this is my last preliminary budget hearing uh, as a council member. Uh, it's been a, 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 you know, we still have a number of hearings left to go, um, but this is my last preliminary budget hearing. So I am grateful to Speaker Johnson for this opportunity to continue to be chair and for all the great work that we've done together. Uh, thank you, Speaker Johnson. And I look forward to fighting for the environment in this year's budget. Pastor, uh, it looks like we might have an additional witness. Oh, uh, okay. Well, then my closing so, statement really wasn't a closing statement then. Uh, okay. Uh, it, turn, it turns out that there was an additional witness and uh, they had, she had not, either she had not received the link, uh, but no problem. If, if we can wait a minute more. Sure, no, no, no problem at all. Okay. No problem. At all. Oh, here she's she's coming now. I don't see her. If it's Ruth, she's just on. She needs to be unmuted. Yes, I'm here. I just unmute myself. Time starts now. All right. So my testimony in regards to the Queen's Library. I remembered I moved in from Nigeria in 2007 and moving in, I didn't know how to use a computer. The only place I learned how to use the computer was at the Queens Library on Guy Abrua. And that was how I learned, you know, I would go there every day on my off days from work. I would spend an hour. If I need to print anything, I will ask the attendant if they could assist me to save. I couldn't even save on flash drive. And that was how I learned all those things before I actually you know, went to college, got my own computer. That was how I learned how to use the computer. So I think this service is important to the community. If we shut it down, I don't know what's going to happen to the community. When you go to the library, you see all the kids coming around. You see the teenagers coming in. And you see the older folks coming in to ask for assistance, asking people to help them. People come there, they want to learn how to use the computer. They have other services that they render to people. I remember even learning how to, how to you know, build my resume. It was a library that, you know, that assisted me in doing that. So I think shutting down the library is unfair to the community. And I will ask the city council to please look into this for the sake of the community because we really need this service. I, it was very advantageous to me. I still go to the library as a matter of fact, to print, you know, of course now we can't go because of the pandemic. So I just want, I appeal to everyone, the city council to please look into this because the community really need this. My husband have a library card, you know, we, you know, so I think we need the service. Thank you for your testimony. I. I agree with you, we have to protect library funding. Um, this committee is uh, something that we have no uh, uh, purview over the library, but as a council member and as a parent and as a community member, I am absolutely engaged on uh, library funding and we'll refer this to Councilmember Ben Bramer as who's the chair of the Cultural and Libraries Committee. So thank you for testifying today. I appreciate it, thank you so much. Thank you so much, thank you. Thank you. Now, Costa, there really are no additional witnesses. Okay. Well, I, I've, I've given my closing statement already, so I, I will not uh, uh, do it a, a, third, a second time. So, <laughs> uh, but thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for the sergeant at arms. I didn't have a chance to thank the sergeant at arms uh, for all of their great work uh, and uh, the, uh, all the staff, uh, the technical staff that make sure these committees are able to happen. Um, you know, that get these Zooms and, and these committee hearings on. And so thank you to all the staff, including our Sergeant at Arms, for making all this great work happen. And again, thank you to Samara, Nadia, Ricky, and John for all your great work and look forward to uh, continuing to move forward on this very critical budget to protecting our environment.
so with that, uh, I will, uh, and Nicholas Lazowski, my, my counsel as well. Uh, so uh, with that, I will gavel this preliminary budget hearing of the Environmental Protection Committee closed.